It gives me great pleasure now to be able to hand over to one of my vice presidents, Tim Eldridge, who's going to talk a little bit uh, about the ideas of mental and physical well-being and mitigating the effects of the coronavirus in order to boost our resilience. Tim, over to you, please. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, it's great to hear from you and um, echo every, every word that you've said. Uh, secondly, to, to Islam and the whole of the UAE branch committee, th thank you very much for uh, inviting me to come along. Um, uh, very, very, very honoured to be able to join your branch uh, today and to see how many um, participants you've got, which is, which is fantastic. Um, just very briefly a little bit about me so um i am one of you, one of your vice presidents um uh, have been this is my second second ter term of office uh, uh, sorry second year of office as vice president um interestingly we're we're going to talk about covid19 we all have so many stories to tell and listening to andrew i mean it's, uh, some of the reality of how we've all been touched by uh, the coronavirus is is really quite um impactful isn't it um my background, my day job, I'm, I'm the, he the head of health and safety for a, a global bank. Uh, and that global bank is significantly um, operational in, in China. So I, I do remember um, very early on in January, um, someone, uh, one of my colleagues phoning me up, I think it was the second week of January, saying, we may have a slight problem over here in a place called Wuhan which I'd never even heard, heard of, um, there's this virus that may be causing a bit of a problem to our branch in Wuhan, as, as the bank had a branch there. And we, we, we did what we did and we, we supported our colleagues over in Wuhan. Wuhan. Little did I know um, in the middle of January that by the middle of May, how this whole event would have panned out. And um, I'm sure that every single one of you have got you know, similar stories to tell, both personal and professional. So what do I want to do to today? Really today is give you an opportunity to have a conversation around some of the um, aspects of, of coronavirus that perhaps are sometimes missed. Of course, we focus very much on, on the physical health uh, of people during this time and, and the impact that the virus has on individuals, on communities, on loved ones. But there's also other impacts, of course, that the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 has been having on us all and and today's an opportunity to talk a bit through that and and what we've done as a presidential team and we we, we all talked together and all gave our own individual stories as well and we we thought it'd be great to come up as a team with a bit of a reflection for our all of our members on some of the the aspects of the psychosocial issues and that, that, that people are facing when it comes to to COVID-19 so Today, I'm not, going, I'm not an expert, I'm not, I'm not a psychiatrist. What I'm here to do is hopefully give, give you, our members, a bit of some, some basic information to help you protect yourselves, your families, and obviously take out into the organisations that you support as OSH practitioners. And hopefully by the end of um, this brief presentation, you'll be able to understand really and describe the negative spiral of psychosocial issues that can happen at times like these and when when we as um, practitioners and um, can reach out and can encourage others to reach out reach out for psychological or, or social counseling assistance so what am i going to talk talk about today um, the topics i'm going to cover are uh, the, the various stages of prevention i'm going to talk about the three variables that determine stress um, and the risk of COVID-19 in that, and, the, and as I said, the negative spiral of these multiple psychosocial issues and how we can break that cause, that chain of causation when it does happen. We're going to have a couple of polls, really keen to hear what you think. So we, I'd encourage you all, hopefully you've all had a poll. Uh, pop up on your screen. So first question is, do you feel anxiety or stress due to the current situation? Don't overthink this, please. Just go with your immediate uh, response and um, think about how the uh, coronavirus situation has been impacting you. So please um, vote and then we'll, uh, we'll hopefully have some results coming up here very soon. Here we go. 
So, there, and not a huge surprise to me, and um, hopefully not a huge surprise to you also, but there we go. Seven out of 10 of us are feeling some form of anxiety or stress due to the current situation. So clearly the topic we're discussing today and um, having, having that conversation is really important both for, for us personally, but also as practitioners when we go out and talk to other people. So we know that, um, that from the science of public health, uh, that really there's three levels of prevention. So the, the primary prevention, uh, of course, is keeping people healthy. Then we go into the secondary prevention. So when people do start to show indications of a problem, whether that be a physical problem or a, a mental health problem, we need to start thinking about mitigating the effect of that. But then thirdly, when people are ill and people then are um, suffering from uh, any particular uh, physical or mental illness, then clearly we need to provide that support. And I think in thinking about those three levels of prevention, what's our role? Well, I, I believe our primary role is to keep ourselves healthy. So the primary prevention, of course, we always need to focus on that. But as we've just seen in that poll, that, that's not always possible. And seven out of 10 of us are saying we're, we're, we're struggling with that primary prevention. So with the current situation and the stresses, our next goal is really to try and mitigate the effect when we do show in, uh, we are showing that we have a problem. And then if we go through that second stage and get into this, this tertiary stage and we do have problems, we really need to get a, to find what the mitigation strategies are and make sure they are successful and if they're not then where do we go for additional help so you can see on this slide um, the six priorities of IOSH that clearly what we're talking about today is absolutely embedded in our six IOSH priorities and that is the maintaining our physical and mental well-being so we, we, in developing this presentation, we've, we've um, looked at a lot of the research around this, and I'm sure many of you are familiar, familiar with that. Um, and this particular slide relates to um, some research by well, a prominent researcher in the area of stress at work, a gentleman called Robert Karasek from the University of Massachusetts. And in his research, he demonstrated that stress can be can be demonstrated by three variables. So the reason this, sl this slide, uh, this image is up is you've got three variables there and you, as you can imagine, they can be moved up and down on that, um, on that um, uh, machine. So what are those three variables? We've got uh, a person's or individual's perception of demand. So what's the demand on them? What's being asked of them? Their perception of control. So how much control do they have over that demand? and an a individual's perception of social support. So what's the framework and what's the environment around them that can help them in managing that control and demand. So for example, when the demand is perceived as high, so you can imagine sliding the demand uh, button up to the top and the control is perceived as low, and particularly where there's a lack of social support, that is when stress will happen. And that will almost certainly um, end up with some, some form of negative health outcome. That may be mild, but that could also be quite severe. So although Karasak's model focuses on workplace stress, this is also really applicable to the current situation we're in with the COVID pandemic. If you think about it, fearing the outcome of the virus translates into a perception of high demand for good health. So that demand, we demand good health as, as individuals, but our fear of that and the impact of that really does, it does, does affect us at this time. And how much in control are we? Um, I'm sure you've all got views on how, how much in control are you of your ability to um, stay st healthy and well during this time? Um, we have Obviously, we're, we're very aware of all of the uh, uh, restrictions, the good, good controls that are in place, whether that be around the distancing, good hygiene. 
but of course the, the level of control we have isn't complete and as, as Andrew shared in his story and also I know many other people who have been unfortunate enough to contract the virus that you know our levels of control are very low when it comes to this particular situation. And then just moving on to social support and if Andrew doesn't mind I'll just use his example as well our ability to inter interact with our environment with people if we don't have that ability that's a, con a lack of social support so Andrew spoke about you know the the feeling of isolation he has being um, away from family friends and home that social support is low the control is low and the demand is high and therefore you can see how very quickly people can come into starting to get some negative outcomes at this time. Now hopefully this is a, uh, a, a diagram we all recognise, so we're, as OSH, OSH professionals we're very used to calculating, um, uh, the calculating risk and using the, the five by five matrix of severity and likelihood. And of course we can use this in the current context. So what is the, the risk level when it comes to um, the, the psychosocial um, risk during this, this, this um, outbreak? And do we think it, it's acceptable? Do we think it's tolerable? Or actually, do we think it's a high risk category? Now, of course, it will be different for every situation. But I think when we talked about those three variables, the demand, the control and the social support, if those buttons are in the wrong place, then clearly we can see how that risk can move into the not acceptable level. This year, um, sorry, the year 2001, so let's just go back a bit into 2001, marked the ILO to the International Labour Organization's entry. They, they came into the area of stress at work and they created a, a, a flagship programme called SOLVE, S-O-L-V-E. And that, in that model, the ILO described um, um, by, um, the, the, the factors by which stress could trigger one or more negative outcomes, or in fact, any or all of the, the, ne the negative outcomes that could trigger stress. And what they said, this could lead to a negative spiral or a negative synergistic effect. So you've heard me speak a little bit, quite a, quite a few times now about this negative spiral. And hopefully in the diagram, you can see what we mean by that. And you think about the whirlpool. And when you start moving in the direction of the water in a whirlpool, it's going to be very difficult to get yourself back up again. And of course, the more factors and the more factors in that diagram impacting you, the more you'll be in that spiral and the most, more difficult it will be to come out of it and indeed already in talking going back to the, the current situation I'm sure you've seen reports in the media that, uh, that there's been a surge in domestic violence and there's also been you know reports of acts of discrimination also on the increase so we are actually absolutely seeing how that is happening at the moment. So moving on to the next slide here's some uh, oh, oh sorry I just want to get, I'll just go back again, bear with me. Apologies, Carrie. So there are some, um, some possible outcomes um, that can be a source of stress. And what we're going to do is show you um, a few of the, um, the, these examples in the slide. And what we're going to do is launch the second poll. So I'll, I'll just click up the second poll and Carrie will launch that. And then as you're doing the poll, I will bring up the, the factors and, and you can see which of those you feel are relevant in, in the poll you've just been asked to complete. So in your current situation, how many of the, these outcomes do you feel you are experiencing? So what we've got there, we've got stress, with uh, people experiencing inadequate exercise, we've got addictive behavior, social insecurity, financial insecurity, inadequate sleep, inadequate nutrition and violence. So just again, don't overthink this, but just quickly, if you could identify those that come up the most from you and we'll, we'll be interested to see what the results say in a second or two. And I'm sure some of these are, are very familiar to you, to many of you. 
So we'll just give it, there we go. Okay, so here we go. So uh, let's have a look at this. So we've got uh, only 4% experiencing none. So, and, and again, I don't think any of us will be surprised by that. So we've got 24%, so a quarter of us are experiencing more than four, four or more, sorry, more than four. So five or more of those stress out, of those outcomes. And, and then you can see, you know, the majority is, is, is at three and, and they've got 15% of four. So, you know, again, I'm not surprised by that. Uh, I'm sure you're not. Um, uh, but it does indicate that for, you know, all of us on this call who are involved, who are impacted by this situation, that we are having ne negative outcomes already. And some of us, and in fact, one in four of us are having five or more of those negative outcomes. So what do we do about it? So um, there was a recent communication from the World Health Organization um, that suggested that the constant news reports about the current situation can lead to feelings as an anxiety and distress. And of, of course, Andrew touched on that, didn't he? And talked about how um, following every single piece of news, whether that be on the broadcast media, in the printed media or more frequently these days in social media um, can lead to, to levels of heightened anxiety and just distress. So, so what, do, what do we recommend and what, what should we be recommending to our colleagues and our organizations? Well, what we would say is really, let's focus on the trusted, the uh, proven sources from those reliable sources of information that we can and clearly the, the World Health Organization is one of the best um, organizations to go to and there are a number of other uh, public health uh, authorities around the world that we can lean on and I would also certainly recommend the European Centre for Disease Communication and it's excellent at this time to provide really uh, trusted and tried and proven evid um, uh, information and of course the uh, the CDC in the US, which which also does that. But wherever you are in the world, your normally your 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 national health uh, health authority um, will have um, uh, be available for you to be able to provide that kind of information for you. And of course, what's the one source of information that I haven't yet mentioned, which we we are all members of, which of course is IOSH, and I'll talk a little bit more about where we can go within IOSH to find more information, which really is pro probably one of the best sources of information for us to break this chain of causality. So the World Health health organization as well um, proposed seven important roles of the occupational safety and health professional during the COVID-19 pandemic so there, there are seven and um, you can you can there's a reference later for you to find out what all of those seven are but I'd just like to, to focus on three of those which I think are really important roles for the OSH professional in this time and those are um, assessing risks providing risk communication and engagement at workers with psychosocial support and collaborating with the community and public health authorities. So looking after yourself as well is an increasingly important part of it. If we are going to be giving that advice, that information and that um, support to our organizations, it's not gonna be very helpful for us to do that if we're not looking after ourselves. Um, and uh, we've got some really uh, interesting and useful and helpful advice from uh, actually from IOSH's own head of health and safety in a, in a recent um, webinar, who suggested that on a personal level, we need to focus on ourselves and others by looking after and listening to our own mental and physical health and well-being. So how many of us are doing that? You know, the old uh, phrase, we, we should practice what we preach. Um, and I do wonder that now more than ever as OSH professionals, we should be um, looking after ourselves with physical exercise and mental exercise as, as much as we encourage others to do it. Looking after our own safety and health. So of course, um, if you're anything like me, you're spending a lot of your time advising your organization or organizations on 
how to look after themselves and be safe and healthy at this time and again all the controls and all the things that I'm talking about with my organization on a daily basis around uh, PPE, around hygiene, around distancing and uh, I've had more conversations about how many people you can get in a lift when you're two meter distancing that's probably healthy but we're doing that but are we, um, are we looking after our own safety, safety and health at the same time? Um, I talked about um, those the, the three risks uh, roles of the professional about the assessing risk and we, and we covered that earlier but that, that risk communication um, are we are we really um, giving the right and most up-to-date information out and is that because we are sourcing that information in the right place and again I mentioned earlier where are we going for that information so let's keep let, it's important as professionals and as OSH professionals we spent our entire career keeping up to date with the most relevant information about um, safety and health and, and, and now is no different so let's keep up to date with the most relevant information let's use IOSH and the public health authority um, um, sites to do that and let's avoid the misinformation and fake news and then the third role I spoke about is the collaborating with community and public health authorities how are we collaborating how are we talking about how we're feeling? Are we encouraging people to talk about how we're feeling? And I think Andrew made, made a really important point about the, the term social distancing, which like it or not, sorry, I've just gone too far, I'll go back. So like it or not, social distancing, distancing is the term being used. But I agree with Andrew, it doesn't, it's probably the, it's an unfortunate term that's now become part of the, 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 the modern vocabulary because it's, you know, that, in, that social interaction is so important to be able to stop that spiral of, of the outcomes uh, that we talked about before of which a quarter of us are feeling five or more so you know this is a great way and it's fantastic that you know so many members are able to attend a branch uh, this this branch meeting that normally would you know would all be you know you'd all be meeting um, in Dubai or Abu Dhabi or wherever it is face to face and having that social interaction we can't do that now but we need to continue this and, and I'm just so delighted to have have all of you on the um, on the uh, webinar today. So I'm, I'm going to finish by just confirming that we've developed a, a, a information sheet. So, you know, I've, I've, I've been re reasonably quick on this webinar. And I think that was important that I was quite quick because, you know, again, for your well-being, listening to someone like me for 45 minutes, I'm sure is going to be very helpful. So um, we, we've, we've summarized what we've got to say in just a, a nice one page information sheet, which really clarifies that your well-being is important in caring for yourself and importantly for others. It also you know, flags the fact that if you feel you're losing control and you're feeling overwhelmed by events, then you must seek support. So you know, I'd say the quarter of us who responded that we've, I've got five or more of those outcomes, you know, let's look for support on, on dealing with that. that. And that support can come from your family, your friends, your colleagues, but of course it can also come from professional help through a from a psychological or social counsellor. So, so this 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 is an information sheet not just for you as as participants in this webinar, but uh, you'll be getting a copy of this and you'll be able to share it with uh, with throughout your organisations and be able to use it to um, to spread the message. The very very brief but hopefully helpful message that I, I've just shared to you today about. Um, our principles of risk management, our understanding of hazard and risk, you know, applies as much now in the COVID-19 situation than it's ever done in any of our previous career. And also it's about that mental and physical well-being and how we, we, we recognize that as a workplace hazard and a real hazard at this time and a risk and how we may manage that. So I did mention further information and again this this will be uh, you'll, you'll have access to this uh, following it but of course IOSH you know without a doubt one of the best places to go that the team at IOSH uh, who support us have done so much fabulous work in um, developing all of this information and, and I, I must thank them on behalf of myself as a member and all of you for the work they've done and, and then I briefly mentioned the WHO and the ILO and of course also the, the other um, uh, public health or, or, uh, authority organisations that you've got. 
so that was my very quick brief um, um, run through and in fact and importantly now I think that it would be good if we um, are able to take some questions and answers for you so so Islam I'll hand back to you and um, thank you very much thank you very much Tim and thank you very much uh, Andrew for uh, the presentations very much appreciated so we've got a couple of questions um, on the Q&A chat box so the first one is about employers expecting too much from OH, OSH professionals. How can we respond to this when you know our leadership teams are expecting us to know the answers, expecting us to know uh, what to do when really uh, globally, you know, everybody's uh, at the same at the same uh, locate, you know, at the same place when, when it comes to answers. That's a, that's a really good question. I, I'll answer that in two ways. Um, uh, and if, I'm che if you allow me to be a little bit cheeky, I'll, I'll answer it in a positive way. From my own personal experience as well, I have never known the OSH profession have more importance, more visibility and more respect among senior leaders than it has at the moment. And I, you know, I, I am immensely proud of the the work that my team are doing in, in, in the bank, but also that IOSH are doing. And, you know, I, I, you know IOSH is, is all over the, being, being asked all over the media to, to comment. Me and my team are, are, are at the forefront now of conversations that I would never have dreamt would have, uh, people would have even asked, probably didn't even know we existed, to be honest with you, never mind asked us to participate in, in conversations. So I think that's a real positive and we as OSH professionals should celebrate that. And of course, the challenge then is maintaining that when all of the, <coughs> excuse me, all of this dies down. But of course, yes, absolutely, the, that, that does lead to pressure on us as, as professionals as we are seen as a go-to person, often by, by our, our senior leaders for answers. And I'll be really clear about that. And I, I've been really clear in, in my day job. We don't know all the answers. <laughs> and just as much as when it comes to, let's say, an accident investigation, um, where there's been an accident with a piece of equipment that we've never seen before, and we're not, you know, structural or civil engineers, what do we do? We go and seek the best advice. So my best friend over the last four months has been the my, my expert medical advisor who, um, I speak to on a daily basis and provides me, you know, and says to me, Tim, there's no such thing as a stupid question. And trust me, I, even today, I was on the call before this webinar to him and I was asking about, um, you know, what do you do about cleaning the inside of cars? And I'm thinking, well, I, should I know that or not? I mean, should they expect the global head of health and safety to know the answer? Well, at the end of the day, I don't. You know, the, the reason this, this disease is called the novel coronavirus is because it's new and so many people don't know. So please, you know, be present, be encouraged by the fact you're being asked questions and celebrate the, the fact you've got visibility, but always feel comfortable to say, um, because of the, the, the nature of this illness and this, this, this virus, and because it's changing all the time, I can't give you an answer straight away, but I will go away and come back. Andrew, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that. Yeah, Tim, you, you make such an important point here about the value of, of OSH professionals. I, as I said in, in my opening address, now is the time for us to shine. And the fact that the question is, what do we do when we're being asked to, uh, expected to answer every question? I, I think that's an indicator of how important we're being seen by leaders in business right now. In fact, I'm, I, I just wanted to add this comment because I need to leave and go straight into another webinar where uh, I'm, uh, I'm talking to the Institute of Directors uh, on COVID-19 and, and I'm their sole guest on, on this webinar as part of their weekly update series. And I just got a note from the organizers to say, over 500 senior leaders and directors are joining that webinar, which is twice the amount that they normally have on their weekly events, which is phenomenal. And, and I think my suggestion to participants here on this call as OSH professionals is to start infiltrating these leadership gatherings. So any of you that are available, it's at one o'clock UK time. So that's in an hour and 15 minutes. You can find details and, and register for, for the IOD webinar on my LinkedIn profile. I've just sent you a, a, a link to, to how to find that. Uh, and you can come and join this webinar and start mixing in here and, and bring the voice of our profession to, to those voices of directors and senior leaders. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know the answer to this question yet, but I've got a good idea on where I'm gonna find the answer. 
and get into some of the resource pages that Tim has shared with you in, in that excellent presentation. So uh, I just wanted to offer that and also to express my thanks, Tim, to you. I thought that was a phenomenal presentation. Very well done. Thank you very much. Uh, Islam, thank you for your welcome and your invitation. Thank you all for your attendance. Uh, I'll sign off and leave you to the rest of the questions now. Thank you again for having me. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Tim, I, I know you mentioned this um, during your slides, but uh, can you recap on some of the relevant um, resources people can use to, uh, to inform themselves about COVID-19 and, and if they need to write SOPs for the companies? Absolutely. So, um, and, and there are, I would say, probably three or four really go-to sources of information. IOSH, of course. And what IOSH, so IOSH isn't, isn't obviously providing medical expert advice. What IOSH has done has taken that medical advice and translated it into practical advice for us all about how we can use that to support uh, the organizations we either work for or we, we, uh, we consult to, or even ourselves. So absolutely, f please first stop shop IOSH. Then of course, I think the, 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 there is a lot of um, uncertainty about the medical uh, and scientific aspects of this disease. Even for example, Mike, again, conversation today is if you do an antibody test and it proves you've got antibodies for coronavirus, does that mean you're immune? Well, I can tell you now that the, 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 scientific, the global scientific evidence just does not exist. So if someone's telling you and trying to sell you a, an antibody test to say, this is your silver bullet, this will save all your problems, say thank you very much, listen to them, but then go to these, these organizations, to the World Health Organization, to the European Center for Disease Communication, and for the US Center for Di Disease Communication. Those are the three that I found the most valuable. That's not saying that the other national uh, health authorities don't provide great information, they do, but those are the three I'd absolutely recommend. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, I guess uh, maybe you can recap again, that there's been questions about the IOSH membership fee. Maybe we can talk about the Benevolence Fund then. Um... Yeah, so just, just back to the Benevolence, uh, the Benevolent Fund. Um, of course, you, you'll all be aware that we've had the Benevolent Fund now for, for many years, and it's a, uh, a, 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 a fund that we, we hold for um, all four members who um, uh, have uh, difficulties for whatever reason that may be and, and need some financial support, whether that for, for, uh, for whatever reason that may be. And we've always had that fund. And, and what we want to say is that we recognize now that our membership are probably in a, 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 often in a, a group of people who may well be struggling financially um, to, to, to make ends meet because of what the, the lockdown has created to their, their business and their personal situation, whether they've been made redundant or they work for an organization that's effectively closed down or that they, they are individual consultants or just that the work has disappeared. If people do, are struggling, then please go to the Irish Benevolent Fund, apply, and that will be, you know, be go through the, the obvious process. But also for those, for those of us who are fortunate enough not to be in that situation, then we can actually help by adding to that fund by donating. And it's a charitable, uh, charitable fund. So if you donate in some, some, some or, um, countries in the world, you can also um, get the government to pay tax on that donation for you as well. And all of the presidential team have, uh, have recognized that we want to support our members and, and made a donation as well. So um, on the Irish website uh, for the uh, Benevolent Fund, you can you've got the links to both donate, but also, also to, um, to ask for support if you need it. Thank you, Tim. Well, one question that I'm seeing uh, all over again, and, and a concept that's really coming to light now um, is return to work. You know, a lot of, I know for myself, um, Return to work is a big thing now at, at work. Um, several questions that have come up. Where can we find resources? And, and what's your your uh, your two cents on return to work and 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 whatnot? Okay, really good and, and a really good question because yes, that's that's dominating my professional life at the moment, as, as I'm sure many others. But just interestingly, because you know, I'll just go back to my day job in the bank. Um, for example, you know, I've got we've got several thousand employees in China who, who actually are nicely back at work and, and, and functioning very happily, we'll, we'll be slightly jealous to know, through to um, you know, the 
tens of thousands of employees, you know, in, in the Middle East, in, in, in Europe, and, and of course in the Americas who, who aren't. So the first thing I would say is once the restrictions are lifted, this is not a race back into the office. The worst thing any organization can do is go, hooray, we are now allowed to, to go back to the office, everybody piles back in. Now, the, the, the best advice would be really clear to people who are making these decisions as professionals that our strong advice is to stop and to think and to plan carefully before we allow people back into the office. The office, is, the office or the workplace and construction sites are another good example are places where people are going to start to come together and what we will risk is what, we, we're, talk, what, we, what we're talking about in a second and a third wave. And we want to be socially responsible as OSH professionals and not, be, not, not work for organisations who've contributed to a second or third wave coming. So first of all, really clear, let's not race back into the office. And secondly, let's plan how we're going to do that. I think, did I mention earlier about lifts and elevators? Uh, again, you know, that's going to be the, in, in big offices, that's going to be the real difficulty. How do you socially distance or physically distance at two meters in a lift? Well, well I've worked it out in our, uh, you know, in, in the majority of buildings, you won't be get, able to get more than two people in a lift in a, in, a, in a two meter apart separation. So again, talk to your, talk to your senior people and say, well, yeah, we can take a thousand people back into the office, but it'll take them six hours to get up to the, to their, their workplace because we're only now two at a time. So why would you possibly want to bring them back in unless, unless you absolutely, absolutely have to. And I recognize manufacturing construction, of course you can't make things and you can't build things from home, but in many environments you can. So, you know, you know, that, that's my advice. Don't rush back and plan. And then, of course, on IOS websites, we are we are uh, providing more and more resources on how to go about that that planning and return to work and how to start building building your your own plans. And then the last thing I'll say before I hand back Islam is why are we IOS members? because we're a network and I can promise you I'm working on a return to work plan for my organization I'm sure you are I'm sure everyone is let's not all invent the same wheel let's share where we can let's share and let's work and support each other thanks a lot Tim uh, any final words for the UAE membership I know we've got more than 280 people who've, who've, uh, who've tuned in to us today any final words from you before we move on to the AGM yeah, well, first of all, I'll reiterate my thanks for being invited, and uh, it's it's just amazing how many people are on. I know, you know, we've got we've got members from all over the world on this webinar, not not just from the from the Middle East, um, but I guess just for the majority of the members in the Middle East, um, you know. I know from you know, I know that you know there is still significant amount of restrictions in place, uh, particularly around uh, in the UAE, but also in the other 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 countries around uh, in the Middle East. I also know it's Ramadan, and that of course itself is, is challenging. And um, you know, obviously, as, as OSH professionals, we need to understand the the challenges that that um, that our, our our colleagues who are uh, who are participating in Ramadan are facing as well. We also know that Eid's coming up and um, that it's going to be, that, that's quite an interesting uh, challenge that's going to come. And of course, we want all of our, 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 our Muslim, Muslim colleagues to be able to celebrate Eid, you know, one, of, one if not the most important um, you know, uh, religious events of the year. But again, it's going to be quite challenging, isn't it, in the current context. And, and, and that challenge will move into the workplace. So, you know, during Eid, when, when people are going to be, to be wanting to celebrate and hopefully doing it in a, in a, in a socially responsible way. But then after, once Eid is finished, they'll be coming into the workplace. And do we know actually quite how socially responsible our employees have been? Uh, during the, the the celebrations, I'm sure the majority are, but uh, as ever, there'll be a small small pocket of people who won't. So, I guess a little challenge to you, to you, you were there in the in the Middle East, just to to think about how you might manage that additional risk of the post Eid uh, re return to work, and again, use the principles we we've talked about today. Other mm -hmm. than that, I ju I'll just say thank thank you again. Uh, we are in IOSH, we you know we are one great massive global community of members. Uh, and as Andrew always says, we are the world's largest membership organization. So let's use that membership. Let's ask each other questions. Nobody has 
a problem that somebody else hasn't faced. Nobody has a question that somebody else hasn't been asked. And nobody has provided a solution that somebody else doesn't need. So let's use those, um, our, our networks, and let's share and support each other. Stay safe and stay well.